So. No, it's not. Or at least it doesn't look too, too interesting. Yeah, I, I assume those um, five, six, sevens uh, are over. Hi to everybody, and welcome to our talk on uh, some technology called uh, data loss protection. My name is Enno. Uh, my name is Angus. Go, Angus! <laughs> oh, Angus, uh, you're well known here. Uh, okay. Um, I'll directly dive into it. Um, we, have, we have not tested how, how it works so together in mean, together presenting. Um, uh, who are we? My, uh, the, we are one old school networker and one previously plump hacker. We leave it up to you to choose uh, who is who. Uh, we have some shared interests in emerging technologies. Some of you might um, uh, remember I gave a talk here last year on uh, kit tracking technologies and um, uh, some of you might know me from Shmu talking about layer 2 fuzzing. So we have some, uh, say, interest and affinity to technologies and uh, an approach how to understand how do technologies work, which security implications do they have, and um, obviously um, from kind of how to break them. Uh, the technology we are going to talk about today uh, which has uh, the title DLP is a very corporate technology. As such, um, uh, Notacon, there might be other places um, to talk about it uh, uh, which are better suited than, than Notacon is. But um, in our talk, we, we do not want to, uh, just to talk about the technology, but to raise some, some questions, um, primarily uh, understand uh, once there is some some new tool in the uh, on the on the desk, the new tool coming into some environment. Uh, some of you might know there is every year there is something the, the sales the smart sales people try to tell you like, um, oh use this and you'll be safe. Um, Ten years ago this has been um, VPNs and five years ago this has been IDS IPS and. Two years ago this has been NAC network access control and uh, nowadays it's CLP. Uh, so it might be interesting to understand once the technology com comes in, uh, what are the implications? And um, that technology we are going to talk about, the main um, purpose it, it's intended for is to protect data. And this is one of the things, um, I mean, that's a very, uh, say, obvious uh, intent. Everybody of us, I assume, has to has to protect data at some points. So it seems, um, oh, there's a new technology which can help us here. And we want to raise the question, or to make you think about um, uh, a bit within this talk, um, <clears throat> if you have to protect data, what, what can be done to protect data? Uh, the agenda is uh, very simple. We'll state uh, what kind of problem, DLP or whatever that is. So obviously, we'll, we'll explain uh, what it is. Um, we'll uh, discuss uh, what's the problem this stuff tries to solve. We'll give an overview uh, how uh, the problem should be addressed and how it works. We'll give a kind of overall assessment. Um, do we think that this is a good technology? Do we think, uh, do we like it? Um, what are, what uh, new problems might it bring? Uh, does it solve what it tries to solve uh, this stuff? And um, uh, at the end of the talk, we'll go back to the initial problem statement and discuss um, uh, that obvious problem of data protection or data leakage. Once you do not want to solve it with uh, some new tool on the desk, a um, new, new kit in the town, but want to solve it with, uh, say, traditional means, uh, what we call, uh, that's a term um, that Brian brought up, uh, which I very much like, uh, that is uh, latent capabilities. Uh, use the stuff you already have to protect your data um, from, from leakage. That's what the L in, in DLP stands for. 
Uh, we'll discuss uh, this one, and that might be um, uh, for those of you who are not in the position of being in large corporations with uh, the latest tools, um, this one might be a very interesting part then uh, to understand um, uh, what, what, what can I do to protect uh, data. The, the problem statement is, I mean, to lose control over one's own data is, uh, say, the primal fear of the information age. Um, uh, all of us, I assume, um, <clears throat> do not want to have their uh, personal assets in some way uh, exposed. Um, and the same obviously applies to organizations. Uh, every of those entities, be, in the, be individuals, be organizations, want to prevent uh, some data, whatever this is, getting out of their control. There's maybe for organizations, those might be trade secrets, uh, marketing plans, um, stuff that's uh, regulated. Uh, remember the talk that just happened here. Um, there's data protection. Once you violate it, you may, might be fined. So you are responsible for protecting some data, in that case, customer data. Uh, this uh, goes hand in hand with the strive for compliance, uh, say PCI compliance, say um, data protection compliance, say GLBA, stuff like this. Uh, organizations are responsible. To, uh, for, uh, to, to prevent some, uh, to lose control over some data. And the same um, applies to individuals. Um, again, uh, there might be stuff on your computers that you do not want to see publicly exposed, uh, be it your tax uh, declaration, be it um, uh, private pictures of your private. Uh, uh, some of you might notice. Uh, uh, who, who knows the name Max Mosley? Uh, that's uh, um, uh, the kind of boss of the Formu Formula One. Um, uh, he's running the Formula One. He's running the main um, uh, organization. He's a very powerful man, very rich and powerful, uh, very respected, at least um, till uh, last weekend. Uh, uh, on Monday, I think, there came out a video which shows Max Mosley with five uh, prostitutes playing some, say, Nazi game, wearing uniforms and uh, doing strange stuff. Um, I, I'm not in a position to judge what he does in his private uh, life. Uh, there, is a there was a large outcry in the UK. Uh, all the uh, Jewish organizations immediately asked him to get back from his post of the uh, primary um, the man in the, in the Formula One. Uh, and there was, from, from a personal point of view, um, I think uh, one can find it very strange what happens in this video. Uh, on the other hand, I am an advocate of, of, of privacy. I think it's whatever he does, uh, as long as he uh, does it in his own space and doesn't uh, uh, violate laws, uh, he can do whatever he wants. But uh, this is... I'm, I'm sure he would have been happy if he had some pro protection mechanism uh, to prevent this data from leaking. A five-hour video uh, with all kinds of strange stuff in it. You know, to self-download. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think it's on, it's on YouTube. Um, but uh, there have been... Um, uh, it was given to one of the large... Uh, how do you say, um, for those newspapers like... Uh, tabloids. Well, tabloids, to one of the largest tabloids of the UK. And they obviously have the full five hours copy. And again, uh, there was whole, lots of strange stuff uh, in that video. Uh, so again, uh, different kinds of entities have a differently motivated intent of protecting their data. Uh, against uh, loss or against um, something that is uh, within that uh, terminology of products that is called leakage. And with leakage um, uh, is, um, is meant data getting out, out of the control, which can happen by different, um, different, uh, different ways. Uh, this is one pretty prominent example. Uh, in uh, f 5th February, uh, this one came up on, on the Times, um, 
Lily Alley, they had some, you know the case better than I do. Uh, yeah, they, there was um, some uh, suggestion that they had used um, uh, less than appropriate marketing techniques in one of the new drugs for treating schizophrenia. And uh, the lawyers were working it out, uh, their lawyers and the government lawyers, and all of a sudden uh, this information was, uh, this communication between the lawyers was sent to the wrong email address, and it became public knowledge. And uh, they anticipate there was a lot of damage done because uh, obviously the information would come out at some point once they had settled, but it would be done in a manner uh, that had been negotiated uh, with the right PR people at the right time, uh, so it was uh, very damaging. In fact, in the story, uh, originally Eli, Eli Lilly uh, had accused the government of leaking the information. That, when, that's the fun part. Yeah, when, when in fact that's not what happened at all. It was uh, one of the lawyers had uh, uh, used all the wrong completion. email address, a full memo containing all the stuff, and uh, this um, title indicates uh, they estimated the, the damage of this re misdirected mail to uh, up to one billion. Um, uh, so this is exactly what uh, those technologies uh, called DLP, which we will elaborate on um, in, in some seconds, uh, want to protect against. So from an organ organizational point of view, they want, uh, do not want this ha to happen. They don't want to be named here, um, uh, given that just was a privacy talk. Uh, some of you might know this. Um, uh, website privacy rights org where they have to report uh, well, uh, they don't have to report here but it comes up here this is the most um, uh, known uh, website um, uh, il reporting uh, data breaches and uh, most organizations uh, do not I think um, nearly all do not want to be here uh, so they want to prevent the data from getting out from getting leaked and this leakage uh, can happen uh, either accidentally. Uh, the most, I think, uh, the most common case is uh, mails that get sent to a wrong recipient, which happens all the time. Um, there might be uh, uh, you reply wrongly to uh, several recipients, um, or might be uh, due to auto completion features, or might be even uh, due to uh, your uh, company name. Um, uh, this is the company I'm running, ERNW, and even for Germans, um, pronouncing ERNW is a bit, say, a little bit difficult. Um, most people tend to say ENRW, not ERNW, uh, which um, means um, misspelling in the mail address. There was another organization called ENRW, and they have a catch all mail address. So once we um, do a typo within an internal mail, it might end up there. And it, this happens in the past. Uh, and that's why we put a, in our transport table, we are running postfix, um, we put a, uh, an entry like, like this one. Mails to ER and W are not delivered. You get an error for this, um, which indicates that the cause. Uh, so, uh, mails that are sent to a wrong email address are the most um, common cause of leakage. Uh, then there is uh, stuff that's printed um, uh, to the wrong printer. Uh, this one I, I, I think probably we can rate as the second most popular uh, stuff. Uh, sensitive data copied over to some um, removable storage, uh, say in USB stick, and that one gets lost. Uh, happens all the time again. Uh, not so well known might be uh, data can leak uh, via file sharing tools. There has been uh, an interesting study from some researchers from Dartmouth College uh, uh, in 2007. They monitored um, P2P communications, they monitored the search terms, and they monitored uh, uh, the kind of documents that were um, exchanged. Um, they used the technology, by the way, uh, that's called uh, Taiwasa. Some of you might not know this uh, kind of technology exists. Um, uh, this might give an idea what uh, this technology is intended for, uh, to monitor P2P communications, um, just to, uh, to notify you this uh, stuff is out there. But uh, okay, they, they, those researchers, they used it and they um, try to identify searches and documents from, uh, I think, the 30 major U.S. banks. 
so um, all uh, account-related documents and stuff, and they found lots of documents shared, probably accidentally, but the more interesting part is they found a lot of searches for those kinds of documents. So there are obviously there are some people participating in the P2P uh, community explicitly searching for leaked uh, banking documents. Um, and in one, in one case, uh, you see this. For one, maybe we found a spreadsheet with 23,000 business accounts, including contact names, account numbers, uh, company positions, and stuff. And uh, so this is another um, scenario where data can leak accidentally. And this is exactly what those tools want to protect against. There are other types of leakage. Maybe the, what we call, um, the first one we call deliberately deliberately and in full awareness, like uh, C-level people uh, trying to close a deal. Um, they need to, oh, I'll, I'll push, uh, con doing some contractions, we have to exchange documents. Um, some tool pops up like, oh, you, you're not allowed to, to put this document on a USB stick. What will they do? They will call you the help desk. Hey, you have to get uh, me relieved from this um, restriction. Uh, I have to close the deal. Uh, even if they know they violate the policy, they regard business more important than the policy. Uh, and there might even be malicious cases, um, people who try to bring out... Um, uh, again, I'm, I'm, I'm from Europe, and in Europe there was... Uh, some of you might have noticed that big uh, Liechtenstein tax scandal, where um, somebody, an employee from a bank in Liechtenstein, which is a, a tax, how do you say? Tax, tax haven. Tax haven. Uh, copied over customer data and sold that um, to, uh, on a CD and he sold that, that CD for 5 million euros to the, the German intelligence. Um, uh, and they sued a lot of prominent people in Germany. And they have, um, I think, so far they, they have gained 400 million in, in, in tax, um, which they get back, so it was a good investment. Uh, this is a malicious case. Um, we will not... In our talk, we will not uh, cover the malicious case as uh, the DLP tools. Uh, they um, uh, do not claim to protect against malicious use. They, pro they claim to protect against uh, the accidental case. And, and that's very significant when we look at this. Um, if, you th if, if you think the reason you, that you're, you're putting controls in place to do this kind of stuff is to get the malicious people or the bad guys or the authorized users with malicious intent, um, the vendors themselves don't even make those claims. Oh, by the way, the, the major windows, we have, we have no slide where we name the windows, um, but uh, to give you an idea, if you ever heard of such products, um, most um, uh, antivirus uh, endpoint um, windows have something, McAfee is a prominent uh, example. There are some dedicated companies like uh, Wantu, which, has, which have been acquired by uh, Symantec, uh, there is uh, Vadasis. Um, in the meantime, Trend Micro has uh, such stuff. Um, I call them the V companies, Vantu, Vericept. I mean, the list goes on and on. And uh, if it's of interest, I'm sure we'll be around the rest of the weekend. We can talk in specifics. Um, and we'd love to hear your experiences, too, if you have any. Um, but uh, this is uh, the most hype technology at the very moment. Every sales guy from one of those companies uh, showing up in large organizations uh, is there like, oh, use this and you will, you will get rid of all your compliance and uh, data leakage problems. Um, just to make clear, thinking about it, the leakage itself might not be the core problem. Uh, as many leakage cases happen on a daily basis without any notice, um, in fact, uh, in some cases, uh, that um, organizations um, from where the data got leaked um, even argue in, in, in that way in the UK last year. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure if this is the same um, case that uh, we are referring to that the guy before us uh, referred to. Um, to uh, that's what I stated. This is the of official statement. Two password-protected disks. Note this, two password protected disks. Why do they say password protected disks? Uh, to uh, give the people a safe feeling, but uh, think about it once more. If they were encrypted, they'd say encrypted, but they say password protected, whatever that means. Um, 
uh, I think that the, the greater public might have understood encrypted, so there's a reason why they chose password protected. But those disks containing details of all child benefit recipients in the UK, 25 million individuals, those disks got lost. They had no records. Um, they should have been sent from one place to another one, and um, they never arrived. But they didn't know, they had no record. Um, when did it leave? Where did it leave? Nothing. Um, and after the, the fact, they, in that official statement, it was said, ah, the police tell me that they have no reason to believe that this data has found its way into the wrong hand. Uh, I mean, you see me smiling. This is, uh, this is uh, completely bullshit. How do they, I mean, how do they know? Uh, and if they knew, would they ever say it? How can you trust the same people losing that data without any record, saying, oh no, they, they did not go into the wrong hands? Oh, crap. Um, but they, they argue in exact, exact that way, uh, listen, we lost it, but there's no problem. Um, the problem would only occur if it got into the wrong hands, if there was unauthorized access. And we tell you that unauthorized access did not happen. So this brings us down that the real problem of leakage might be the unauthorized access. Uh, we'll get back, later get back to this. Uh, I, we just want to make clear at this point, leakage itself um, may or may not happen. Uh, the real problem from a personal or organizational perspective is there might be unauthorized access to some sensitive data. So how does this stuff work? There is a, a pretty good white paper we reference here um, from an ex-Gartner guy uh, doing lots of, um, he has a lot of publicity in the, in the, in the space of DLP. Uh, but uh, this is a good definition, products that, based on central policies, Policies identify, monitor, and protect data at rest, in motion, and in use through deep content analysis. So some tools which look at data, uh, be on file servers, that is uh, data at rest, uh, be it uh, transferred via networks, in motion, or in use, um, people who do something with the data, and those tools try to monitor and understand, oh, this is sensitive data, it shouldn't be it should leave this network or it, uh, it should be copied over to a USB stick, uh, stuff like this. Uh, DLP is mostly um, a summary term um, which might mean uh, data loss pro prevention or protection, there is data leakage prevention protection, uh, other terms include uh, exclusion prevention. My personal favorite. Yeah, but I mean there is um, some, some confusion about, about exclusion prevention as there is the book of um, uh, it just sounds dirty. Richard Baitlish, uh, um, and he describes other stuff than this one. Uh, again, we, we, we named some window names. Um, uh, how, how, does, uh, these tool, how do these tools usually work? Um, this might be, they might be placed um, at uh, some, some place in the network, passively monitoring the network the data flow. Uh, they might be integrated into proxies. They might be integrated into the email workflow, like sitting on, uh, uh, in, integrated in, in, in an MTA or sitting on an extra hop. Um, this, uh, all these are the, say, um, network-based variants. And um, uh, usually the um, data in use this uh, piece is um, try to uh, be addressed with, with some host-based agent. So install uh, some agent on all your, say, Windows desktops, and that agent uh, looks, oh, uh, this file containing credit card numbers should not be copied over to a USB stick. Uh, if, um, uh, if that happens, I'll pop up and I'll block the action. Um, so there's a network-based approach and the host-based approach with an agent, and there are some products who, which combine both approaches. Um, the key requirements for such an agent to work, uh, to do what it promises to work, uh, to do is uh, it has to monitor the network stack, uh, monitor the file system, monitor the kernel, or at least the I/O operations, some data to a USB stick. And this um, and it's I, got to coexist with all the other agents on your endpoints. Uh, yeah, 
and uh, this um, we'll, we'll get back to possible uh, we'll, we'll um, refer to possible attack vectors later within the talk but um, some of you might already have a bad feeling hearing oh there is something sitting on the endpoints which has uh, access to the network stack and the kernel and the file system it's a new product and this stuff should make me more safe uh, how can it um, uh, that might be uh, induce uh, the opposite um, yes finding ODAs in uh, in such agents might be very very interesting as uh, they those agents identify the keys for kingdom they identify the sensitive data ideally they, they do this um, there are different methods how to do this this might just be some rule base uh, like a credit card number is looking uh, uh, like this and look for all data looking like this pattern uh, this might be a file matching like um, in, in file names or p parts of the file uh, say contracts um, all contracts begin with um, uh, uh, a similar first page look for all documents that has a similar first page um, indexed in some way uh, there might be some statistical analysis or hashing of documents all this the different techniques if you're interested in those techniques as uh, again uh, we refer to that uh, white paper uh, this is how a, an example product might look like uh, there is uh, an agent running on the endpoints uh, which has an engine for intercepting data uh, get, get a hand on data try to uh, detect um, possible incidents with that data report those incidents and maybe sto uh, storage of forensic data for later uh, forensics on the incident um, uh, this is the agent side and this is uh, usually uh, the, um, the management uh, administration console there where you define the policies and there's a report database and the forensic store um, this is just to illustrate how these products generally look like uh, from an architectural point of view uh, so obviously these products have different approaches to say uh, to address a problem which we have already identified as a as an important problem and a problem um, everybody might uh, face in some way so what is um, what is our problem then with these uh, uh, products or technologies um, why do we have a talk here um, about uh, about this stuff um, the overall assessment from us uh, we have uh, some practical hands-on we have um, done some theoretical analysis we are at the moment building a lab uh, as we think there is uh, lots of uh, ODAs uh, to be found in that stuff but uh, the overall assessment uh, from our perspective is um, uh, those tools um, uh, do not work as advertised in most environments as uh, some requirements are not met um, they might not solve the real issues and they might even induce new attack vectors um, uh, what about uh, think of uh, uh, say um, some Asian Republic uh, and their state um, driven hackers finding an ODA in such a product uh, uh, w enabling compromise of all endpoints and identification of all sensitive data um, this, the, the damage might be far greater than what have, might have happened without such a tool uh, we'll go through this um, three, three steps they won't work they might not solve the real issues and they might induce new attack vectors um, uh, first thing why won't they work well I mean yeah we're going to go through each of the uh, uh, details for the organizational requirements not being met but I think we'll go back one slide there Anna, please uh, from a basic uh, high level complexity kills so you heard me rail it's another agent um, for ha having a holistic solution if you want to make sure you're stopping all the leaks you're plugging all the holes it's not enough just to have the network based it's not enough to have the endpoint uh, do you have unstructured data where are your data assets are they located just on a couple servers or are they everywhere so where do you start that's one of the big challenges um, and then as far as uh, 
uh, only some leak vectors, so each technology has a very specific focus, network-based or, or agent-based. How do you deploy them? And then again, uh, the fact that if uh, users are turning them off or if they rebel against you, uh, they will definitely uh, just kill the, any effectiveness that you have with this technology. So, <clears throat> so we'll just go through um, you know, some of our high-level stuff. If, you, to be successful, you're still gonna have to have uh, a document and effective data classification scheme. How are you going to know if this is an asset that shouldn't be leaving your environment? If you have uh, a, an actual hit on something uh, that's important uh, or if it's just test data. Uh, because we are teaching our developers to use test data, right? They're not supposed to use live data, so it's very uh, possible that you might uh, misclassify something. Uh, if you have a documented and, and uh, mature incident response procedure, it's not going to do you any good to create tons of work for people that they can't respond to. Uh, it just creates a paper trail, which is probably not good for your, your organization. Uh, you better budget for FTEs. This is a very corporate term, but it's people, full-time employees, taking care of all that work that you just generated. So it's a whole new industry. This might be a place to, to look for a new career. Um, you'll need them. And uh, actually investing in those people might not be a bad thing. So this could be bringing this technology in might actually beef up your security department. Uh, certainly there's some, uh, some potential for uh, uh, job uh, preservation there. Uh, if you're not prohibiting the use of webmail, well, there's one uh, nice avenue for stuff going out the door. Um, and if you are, I'm sure you'll see lots of false positives in those streams uh, where there's some maybe personal communication that's uh, communicating uh, assets that get hit uh, that, ha that are not uh, a part of the organization's assets, but those people's assets, so they can uh, communicate that. And, and web mail is, uh, uh, happens all the time as well. Um, in one um, environment where we evaluated the technology, uh, developers are sending, there was some, on, on, with that, um, we had some, some products, uh, and one of those products has a flag like, uh, look for source code leaving the environment. And uh, we got a lot of hits, and it turned out uh, there were some contracting developer, developers who sent out the source code to their Gmail accounts. Um, every, every night, like, oh, this is my, my worker, uh, and I send it to my Gmail account to, uh, to kind of uh, back up or um, to work on it further when I'm at home or whatever. Uh, obviously, this was... Uh, uh, against uh, the policies in that place, but those um, contracting developers didn't even know. We call them stupid human tricks. Uh, nothing malicious there. Somebody's trying to do their job. Uh, they are innovative. We, you know, we value innovation, right? So uh, they're finding a way to get their job done uh, under budget and on time. And then, of course, if you don't have a, a accountability or what I term a culture of accountability, uh, where you uh, correct this behavior uh, and get people working for you instead of against you uh, when they violate these type of policies, uh, game over. I mean, so these are all criteria uh, that you really are going to have to consider um, even if on top of buying any kind of technology. And now, um, those of you who are from uh, some corporate uh, information security space, ask yourselves, how many of those have, uh, do you have? Uh, we do not know many organizations um, which could uh, make their crosses here. And uh, um, what, what, we, what we saw in, a, in, a, in the live environment when looking at these uh, technologies, um, we saw a lot of uh, travel planning stuff, like um, uh, someone in a department was responsible for travel planning of uh, the people of that department and made hotel bookings and stuff, and uh, there were, all the time, there were credit card numbers included. And all these um, actions brought up uh, uh, incidents and... Uh, uh, Positive hits on the tools. Uh, yeah, that had to be taken care of. I mean, one, one could fine-tune the filters, but then again, it's an uh, effort to fine-tune. Uh, what, we, what we notice... Um, uh, more was uh, customers sending uh, in that environment, uh, which is uh, quite a large one, uh, 10,000 um, uh, people are getting their network traffic through the point we, we had to look at. Uh, customers sent credit card data in all the time. 
Um, a lot of times the people will open up a, a support call and they'll send in their username and password and say this isn't working right or uh, yeah, here's my social security number. And, and the interesting question there is, uh, is that's data ingestion, right? You now have this asset, are you liable for it? Are you now the custodian of that data? Uh, and if that data were actually sent in via email and it bounced, bounced back up because that person is no longer with the organization and it's got all your corpse header information, so I'm, I think there'll be some interesting uh, case law in the future uh, along that space. Yeah, and, and one could even argue, is it, is, it, uh, um, is it your responsibility to protect somebody sending you his or her uh, private data? But uh, once you have such um, you know, tools uh, in, in, in effect, uh, this might pop up. And maybe you take a proactive approach and you start to educate uh, your users or your potential customers. Oh, you shouldn't send us this data, but uh, your sales department obviously, most probably won't like, uh, oh, we, we can't educate our customers. Uh, if we try to, uh, to uh, dictate them uh, which kind of mails to send us, uh, uh, they might choose another window or whatever. Uh, one one big piece of problem one yeah, big piece of problems is webmail. Uh, webmail should be uh, in, in in most organizations. So we know uh, webmail is uh, allowed to a certain degree, uh, maybe uh, only during breaks, but whatever. Um, uh, I mean, webmail should be encrypted. But if it is encrypted, uh, then the DLP is blind. Uh, if it's not, if it's unencrypted, which happens um, depending on the type of webmail you use, and with Gmail, for example, it dep um, depends on the way you get into Gmail. Some of you might know that uh, uh, depending on the way how you invoke Gmail, it is unencrypted by default. Um, Probably the only way that we'd have the example about the source code going uh, outside of the organization. Yeah. Um, then a lot of false positives pop up as uh, there are people using their private webmail accounts to do their whatever they buy something and send their credit card data. Uh, I mean it's not the organizational problem again uh, to cure this. Uh, if one took the stance like hey listen um, valued employees so we noticed that some of you um, uh, are sending their credit card data uh, together with all SSNs, whatever, out by their webmail accounts, you shouldn't do so. Uh, they might feel uh, spied on. Uh, I mean, in, in, um, uh, in Europe, where I come from, this uh, would be highly illegal. Well, we're getting used to it, so if it doesn't bother us anymore uh, mm -hmm. in the States. Uh, the, this, this class in the, uh, the upper part and some of the ways we're dealing with this, uh, I term this uh, broken business processes. Uh, the, the Gmail source code, uh, there's probably a facility in that organization to actually safeguard that and communicate it in an effective way. But because of uh, typical email file size blocking, they'd have to go to something like a Gmail. So the broken business process is people don't realize there's another mechanism. They haven't been uh, instructed or educated. Uh, around that. Uh, similarly, uh, people might not have uh, understand how to educate the client, the customer, um, uh, or that even uh, their, their Gmail is not secure, it's not encrypted by default. Uh, and, and all this made up at least 90% of all the incidents that popped up. So how are you going to find and any all malicious these are stuff? no incidents. Um, where is uh, coming from, looking from the corporate perspective or the data owner perspective, all this uh, it's not, uh, might not be problematic. Uh, some people argue that those DLP tools can help you understand what goes wrong or uh, help you understand where your data go. Uh, not um, so much protected, but um, oh, you have no idea what, what's going on with your data. Uh, find out by deploying DLP. Uh, we think this is a bit, um, we, call, it's, it's, we didn't uh, coin the term, it's uh, the, the PEMPAR approach. Uh, there is a very good blog entry we have in, in the reference um, a slide uh, from a guy called Angus Kidman. who says, every, unfortunately, every time I hear the word leakage, I get a vision of nappies. And he elaborates on that, um, uh, I mean, kids using nappies have not yet been educated, um, how do you say, to go to... Trained to go to the toilet, to toilet trained. 
Uh, and as long as they have not been toilet trained, you put nappies. Uh, you can put on the nappies all their life, or you can toilet train them. He's an Aussie, uh, so the, the, diapers. So the, the approach of toilet training might be the better one than using some nappy kind of uh, tool. And um, for us, um, that approach like, oh, you can find out what to protect with the help of the tool is a bit like, um, oh, well, wasn't the tool supposed to protect me? Uh, what does it protect? Ah, you find out with the help of the tool. Uh, you, you get a logic, there is um, a, a strange logic, or oh, no logic within that. It's like uh, buying a firewall, and when, uh, when it comes to configuring the rules, ah, I have no idea about the rules. I thought this tool, this stuff would tell me what rules I have to use. Uh, and this is how it works a bit in the DLP space. So, the first part of the overall assessment was, from our experience and what we think this stuff does not work, and does not do what people expect it to do. Uh, the second piece of the overall assessment is uh, there might be additional attack vectors, and quite, quite a few of those. Uh, I took many of uh, the ideas of this part uh, from um, uh, last year's Black Hat presentation, so um, kudos to those guys. Um, the, the Black Hat presentation wasn't given, it was cancelled, obviously for legal reasons, um, but they have published at least uh, um, uh, most guys from Matasano um, published uh, the, the paper, and they had uh, they went over what what can go wrong with DLP. Um, there is an agent that has to run with high privileges. If not, it couldn't interfere with the network communication, couldn't interfere with DIO and stuff. Uh, as the windows are pushing that stuff into the market, um, they found out uh, most of the uh, there are. Um, Lots of common uh, libraries used um, in those agents, like uh, think OpenSSL. Um, what happens if the agent is compromised? So there's another piece of software which hasn't gone through a quality, um, very high or deep quality assurance, running on all your uh, workstations and try to protect your data. Another attack vector might be within that agent, the engine, the parser. That stuff has to look at all files, so it has to uh, be able to parse files. And uh, those of you who have ever been in fuzzing know that, oh, parsing, that sounds good. Uh, there must be a parser. So if we, what, 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 what if we inject uh, data that, uh, that the parser uh, crashes? Uh, and we, we think uh, one of the reasons we, we built uh, the lab at the moment is we think there's lots of uh, bad stuff to be found in this space. Uh, what about uh, the management uh, stuff? Uh, once you get control over the management, um, you have control over all the, you might have control over all the stuff. Management and the solutions we had a look at was web-based administration consoles. Um, uh, we have to define who has access to the management. Is it InfoSec? They um, might not understand what's going on. Is it user help desk to solve initial uh, problems? Uh, is it HR? Whoever it is, and compromise uh, this uh, stuff might mean uh, you have the keys, of the, the keys to the kingdom. So aside from the fact that um, bringing a new technology in adds complexity, and adding complexity is always, always bad security-wise, Aside from this very general stance, um, this technology, due to its own complexity and architecture, might induce lots of lots of new attack vectors. And if, you, and if you could also see the communications between the management and the agents actually hitting on some of the uh, uh, filters, so it could be a nice, uh, interesting looping situation there. And so um, it's not uh, only not doing what. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, it was intended to do, but uh, might cause n new problems, might uh, decrease the, uh, or increase the overall risk situation or decrease the overall security situation. Uh, so let's uh, think about, back to the pro problem, what can be done instead? If we advocate, oh, to solve the problem of leakage, it might not be a good idea uh, to use this uh, stuff of tools, uh, that's a negative point of view. Um, uh, it's a legitimate question to answer then, okay, what else should we do? 
and uh, we um, in the next slides we want to describe a very general, very um, high level concept what, what could be done uh, with the existing uh, methodologies and tools um, and uh, to understand um, what happens or what problems DLP tries to address we have defined some entities, one entity we call a trusted network, your network and the rest are untrusted networks and within your trusted network you might have systems that have external interfaces and uh, that don't have um, communication capabilities to the outside world say um, those file servers, file servers. Usually, you, you you do not run um, um, mail clients on your file servers. Ideally, you do not, and you don't put a USB stick every day in your file server. So these systems, uh, from their data, cannot leak by the classic leak um, methods: mail or browsing or um, putting to external storage. And there are systems that have external interfaces. Uh, the endpoints, desktops, where mail clients are running, where you have USB ports, um, where your users sit, which uh, might um, uh, use webmail, might use Skype and stuff, uh, so untrusted uh, stuff on the, on, on the workstations. And uh, I mean, it's users, so um, they, they can make mistakes. That's human. Uh, so looking at the, the, the way data takes within that very simple concept of trusted and untrusted and ex with external interfaces and without, there is migration of data from a system, uh, from a file server to an endpoint might be, and there might be the, the leakage process, uh, data leaving the trusted space going to untrusted space. Now, strictly speaking, the latter one, this one is only a problem if uh, the point where the data arrives is malicious or compromised in, um, in advance, uh, and if the data is unencrypted. And looking at this um, immediately kind of um, brings up um, possible ways to address the problem. Uh, think of this, well, well, that's what happens, uh, data comes from um, file server to endpoint, leaks from there on, uh, and uh, the question could be, why is this one needed? Why does the data have to leave the uh, systems um, without external interfaces and go to the endpoints? Uh, one could ask, uh, why have sensitive data on the endpoint uh, at all? And we are, um, we are advocates of stuff like uh, server-based computing, data not being processed on endpoints. I mean, we are, we are realists, we know um, uh, just based on this talk, no, nobody will, you will not start um, designing your architectures uh, on uh, next Monday. But think about it. The data has to be here uh, before it can leak out. Prevent the first step or reduce the first step might be the first step in addressing the overall problem. And, uh, okay, now let's assume the data is on the endpoint and the data leaks, so it gets out, one might pose the question, uh, this entity here can, can only use the data if it's unencrypted. So simply said, use encryption on those points where data can leak. I mean, this is very, very basic stuff. We put it in here to make you think about the problem of leakage and the parts of the problem of leakage. Um, and encrypt the data. It's easy to encrypt data uh, on USB sticks or to have a centralized mail encryption gateway. Uh, even though this might, um, uh, this is technology which has to be brought in and to uh, um, be sponsored and stuff, uh, it might be much better to invest on uh, this stuff than on investing on a new complex in itself, uh, immature technology like DLP. And uh, just another, on the current regulations, if it's encrypted, you don't have to disclose, which is one this of the biggest, and, biggest and business concerns. Especially in the context of the talk before. Uh, you might remember this, those federal state legislation that um, mandates uh, disclosure of um, lost data. Uh, once it is encrypted, uh, you do not have uh, from an organizational point of view. 
So we mean it's, it's just about information flow. Uh, flow. Um, understand where the data is processed and how it flows. And once you've understood this, all the instrumentarium that's already there, like access control, like logging and monitoring and encryption, uh, all this used properly might already solve the problem without being um, forced to bring in a new, complete new um, class of products, which are, by the way, are pretty pricey. Um, it's five or six number uh, figures usually to, to deploy such stuff. And still the organization think, uh, um, most uh, organizations love this stuff at the, in the current discussion. They are all excited. Oh, those problems, we wanted to get rid of this. It's being peddled as uh, compliance snake oil, basically. And, you know, buy the silver bullet and all this stuff goes away. But, you know, I, I think you see the trend in this where we're at is that it's, it doesn't. The basics have to be there. And if you're not doing the basics, only the thing the new technologies do is create uh, complexity, which kills security. Uh, so understand the way your information flows. DLP might help there. Once you bring in DLP to get an understanding of your information flow, one might argue, okay, uh, it's a bit pricey way to learn this, but okay, um, at least as you learn it, um, uh, you understand it afterwards. But once you understand this, and once you take care of um, typical, we have named two pieces um, that are often overlooked, um, uh, even on, on endpoints, say a Windows-based um, laptop, which has uh, working with EFS. Uh, once um, people get attachments uh, with their, um, uh, and, and those, uh, those attachments are stored in, in temporary folders of the mail clients, uh, say um, in some environments, uh, Outlook. Uh, uh, even with my, um, I'm using, I'm mailing like this uh, with, with Matt uh, and VI on FreeBSD. This is my mail uh, stuff. Even there, once um, I usually I SSH into my box and do my mail. Uh, once the connection gets broken um, and I do not use the screen, um, there might be a, a written a temporary file of Matt, which contains the last mail I edited, and this is in temp. I mean the permissions are set. Uh, to only the owner, but it's still data that's in, that is, that's in temp and, and, and uh, slash TMP, um, and uh, uh, slash TMP might not be encrypted in, um, in contrast to my, uh, to my home there. Uh, so temporary file locations are an often overlooked point. Uh, the, the mode of information sharing, people are abusing, uh, say, MS Exchange as a f file um, platform. Um, this, once you understand this, it's easy to use the, 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 the tools you already have to address the problem. Uh, okay, I mean, there's uh, the two examples. Uh, one of the most uh, prominent um, reasons for uh, misdirected emails is autocompletion in, uh, in some mail clients. Uh, uh, this, this is just to, to give um, very basic examples of what could be done once you understand this stuff. Understand what happens on a very basic level and put, your, put the right controls in the right places. You don't have to buy a new tool. So, overall summary. I mean, um, data leakage is a real problem. And this real problem tries to be addressed by a new class of tools uh, gaining quite some publicity uh, since, uh, I'd say, six or 12 months, and uh, uh, in lots of uh, fields uh, the stuff is discussed. We think those tools are immature, they do not um, uh, address the real problems and, and in the right way, and uh, once you want to really address leakage, um, understand the information flow, and you will be able to do so with the, the current tool space. That's the message we want to uh, send out uh, with the talk. Are there any questions? In the back. In the back.
uh, true, but that again is, um, might depend. We, the DLP stuff primarily tries to address accidental leakage. Um, Not a if, malicious if user. Your people, um, um, if it's a common practice in your environment that people burn their CDs, you should think about, okay, how, what can I do there? Uh, but uh, from our experience, the, the main uh, stuff is USB sticks, um, which get lost. This is the primary um, mail and lost USB sticks. And, and if you have a policy against doing those, I mean, your iPods, that whole class, if you're not, that goes back to the earlier slide. That if you're not enforcing those policies, which are, make good sense, um, then game over. I mean, no, no silver bolt's going to help you. I stole that from you, Tim. I know you did. <laughs> Any more yeah. questions? That's not a question, but it's more like a statement. Okay. It seems like that a lot of these tools are being built to protect the upper management of companies. From liability or going to jail? or Yeah, and yeah. it seems like they're not really embracing the using of a lot of these security tools because they seem to be, um, it's more difficult for them to do what they want to do. So they'll call a complaint. The, the, the irony of it is, is the, the people who are bringing it in and championing it would be the first ones to call the help desk and say, turn this crap off because I can't do my job. This is absolutely why we think that this is a failed strategy. Oh, we, we have cost a, DLP people a lot of money. Yes. How could this happen? Yeah, we don't have to worry about it. So is the, the main, <clears throat> main uh, way of preventing all this happening is having a, an accountability uh, culture? And accountability. Understanding where the information goes. And, um, Understanding the value of the data. Yeah, I mean, it's, um, data is here. It has to get here. Um, in, most environments, it has to get here. The first piece of control, access control here. And then it has to leak, leak unencrypted. So there are so many pieces within here where you can... So don't data type it. it, just encrypt everything. And then you have one way of dealing with all the data. Or figure out what your data typing is and don't have 15 different levels. Have three different levels and make people accountable for it. And every time they create a, an asset or check out an asset, make sure that they're signing up for that. Now, that's what a lot of the solutions do. Pop up, you are about ready to email a piece of data that's possibly sensitive. Are you sure you want to do this? Click, yes. Are you really I, sure? I want to get my walk done. Now, this creates user fatigue, which then ends up with the same system as you start tuning down. So it's a vicious circle, and I think time will prove that this is, you know, this year's NAC, which is, you know, last year's PKI, uh, and in reality, it, so I mean, it sounds good, the goals are good, um, but in practice, we don't think it's going to be as effective as some of the things we've described, which is just good And old it basic. might even bring up new attack vectors. Absolutely. Somebody's going to make some money from ZDI, right? Yeah. yeah. Maybe, or maybe they won't sell it to ZDI. Maybe they'll use it in another way. Question? Yep, the sh they'll follow the, the sheeple, yep. Right, and then the response is always like, you know, oh, we lost a billion credit card numbers. Let's give all those people a year of free credit monitoring and move on with our lives. How do you think that that kind of attitude, that sort of blase attitude towards these high-profile leaks? The, the slaps on the wrists? I mean, there's not really been, there's been compelling events, but look, have you stopped using any of those vendors? I mean, TJ's Max is actually, uh, they dip for a while, but then the business is, keep, is still going. Yeah, but I, but I have to bring in the FTC for 20 years or something, don't no. I? You know, that's, uh, that maybe in a, in a business analysis, maybe that's not as bad as, as doing what might be a, a very uh, burdensome, hard, you know, why don't people do security well? It's because it's difficult to do it well. It's hard to have that kind of discipline. Um, so I think until it really becomes you know, a cost-benefit value analysis, um, we'll continue to see lots of Again, vendors make lots it. of money on snake oil. Uh, okay, we are, we are both uh, co um, conference organizers ourselves. We know how um, important it is to stay on time. Um, it's 3 o'clock, our talk's finished here. Thanks for your attention. If you have any more questions, we feel can. free. We are... We are here the whole weekend uh, and uh, enjoy NotaCon. Hey, uh, you guys, Batman and Robin.
Okay. <laughs> you were just the sidekick. Yeah. Thanks later. <laughs> Rustic metal, that's a good one. Who gets, uh, they can use the handle. Yeah, okay. Mic instead of uh, uh, whatever. This, I think this is the one. I don't know where they're at. They'll, they'll hook you up. But unless you want to do the handheld, you're going to be typing. You know. So you give the uh, your tax. Uh, I'm the one replacing it. Okay, but you give his talk then. <laughs> not really. I give mine. <laughs> it's on the but same subject. Mm, not. Okay. Well, what it's about? Uh, it's about uh, <laughs> audio in 4K intros. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's. Uh, well, I'll, I'll say here. Um, yeah, from what we got, uh, you go over. I think. Yeah. Which uh, we might not. No, you stay here too. You're staying here. I just want to see if uh, if Jerry's a guy or a girl. I just want to peek in there to see if Jerry's a guy or a girl. Battery will last. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. So if we go to battery scheme. Okay. You've got two and a half hours, so. Um, okay. So, turn off monitor uh, after two hours, turn off hard disks after 30 minutes, never, never. Ah, oh, shit. Is this room bigger than it was last year? <laughs> <laughs> 